my audio. Um, so <laughs> I can hear you. <laughs> you can hear me, but nobody else out there could hear me. So oh, um, <laughs> I will just very quickly again, because it is important, um, pay my respects to um, the Jajarang uh, and Nanda regions where both Bren and I are coming from um, and acknowledge their culture's ongoing connection to country and pay respects to their elders past, present and future. Um, so uh, welcome everybody. Um, Again, my name's Stuart. <laughs> I'm coming to you from Goldfields Libraries. And with us, we have the very talented, multi-award winning Bren McDivill, who is coming to us from um, Karata in WA. I'm coming to you from Calbarry. Calbarry, oh! I knew I should have written that down. <laughs> Calbarry in WA. We'll start with K up here. <laughs> <laughs> Too many Ks. Um, now, Bren is, as you can see on her screen, the author of three absolutely brilliant young adults Sorry, not young adult, junior fiction novels, How to Be the Dog Runner Across the Risen Sea. She is also, if I can get my little oh. logo up. Ah, oh, you've got it ready. I'm going to check my slide up. There we go. In the Dark Spaces, which she wrote under the under the uh, pseudonym Callie Black, yes. um, which won many prizes, including Australia's um, most important sci-fi prize, the Oradia Award, which is amazing. Yes. Yes. Um, and I mean, it's not even you, but you can see these are gorgeous covers, absolutely gorgeous. And you just have this sort of knack for your designers winning awards to the covers too, I've noticed. Yeah, this, this cover won an um, award. Mm. Um, that was Astrid Hicks won a big award for that. Um, Arbia cover of the year. And Joe Hunt, who has designed these three covers, she's also won some prizes. Yeah, and so, so and um, cover. I think half of her entries <laughs> in the Arby Awards this week yeah, with Jo Hunt. <laughs> She's very busy. <laughs> um, that's good. I've, um, now, um, your most recent one, the one we really should have a, at least a very quick talk about, is Across the Risen Sea, which, great book, really. Thank you. I mean, they're all great. <laughs> um, set in a uh, near future, maybe not too near future, where... The sea has risen, climate change has definitely occurred, um, and a whole group of survivors have developed their own cultures, which don't necessarily all gel with each other. Um, and we follow one brave young girl who's trying to make that less dangerous for everybody just because she thinks it's something she has to do. Um, and she's a great character too. And, and mm. oh, I've been blanking on names all week. Um, it was... Neoma. Neoma, thank you. Neoma, <laughs> which means new moon. New moon, yes. Yeah. Now, there was, a, um, mm -hmm. there was a story about the way you came up with the names in the book, wasn't there? You thought very hard about it. Yeah, I'm, I'm always thinking about names in the future and I'm always interested in names because um, coming from Victoria, you'll know that the trend in Melbourne is to be very traditional, like all the Edwards and Williams and Lucy's yep. and, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Elizabeths and you know yes, very traditional names thing. but over here on the west west Australian coast they're always thinking up new and fun names and um, I like to think about what kind of names would be in the future so and how to be it was really easy because the um, I named all the children after what was precious which was flowers and fruit so they've all got fruity flowery names uh, the dog runner is um they, they were more traditional names because it's closer to our time and I sort of imagine them getting out of Melbourne in that story. So we've got Ella and Emery. Uh, across the Risen Sea, I was thinking about what kinds of names you might call your children in the far future when it's a watery, a watery world. Um, and the Oma means new moon, so I was thinking new hope because these children were born sort of as things began to settle. So parents had a lot of hope for new beginnings. And her best friend is called Jaguar, whom she calls Jag. And I was thinking, well, you know, big cats. When people move up to the high country, probably big cats would be something that's quite exotic and, you know, far away. Or maybe Dad just liked old cars, who knows. <laughs> but, yeah, I thought that was quite an exotic name in the future. So her best friend's called Jaguar. <laughs> um, now, one on the kids, one thing that is true of a, almost all of your protagonists is they're, they're all a little wild. They're all <laughs> a little carefree and um, 
Um, and how much of that came from you growing up as a farm girl in New Zealand? <laughs> yeah, I think I was pretty independent. I think I'm still pretty independent. <laughs> um, what, I, what I was trying to show, um, especially with Neoma and Peony, was that they were um, completely in control of their small little world. So Peony on the orchard, she was completely um, comfortable in the orchard. She knew everything. And one day she was going to run the orchard. So she was very very at home there and she could master that little world. And I wanted to show the same thing with um, Neoma that she was comfortable being a fisher, a fisher girl and a um, salvaging girl. And she was, she knew how to run a boat. She knew how to catch fish. She knew how to do a lot of um, chores and she'd swim and do a lot of stuff. She was very, very capable. So by making them quite independent and out there and, and capable, I'm trying to say, look, you know, you can trust these kids to tell you the story because they know what's going on. Um, even though their focus is really, really narrow, I think kids uh, kids who read trust these characters, whereas adults think they don't know anything about the world. And <laughs> I think the books are much scarier for adults than they are mm. for kids for that reason because adults think, you know, these kids are out of their depth, whereas younger readers go, oh, these kids know what they're doing and they trust them more. Yeah, and it's only fun if you're re when you're reading if they're in a little bit of danger or something a little yeah, bit scary is yeah. happening. Um, now, I was um, going to try and direct most of my questions at um, kind of writing styles and writing techniques and all that kind of thing because um, that's something you said you were interested in talking about. And also because <laughs> NaNoWriMo is coming up and anybody who's watching who doesn't know what NaNoWriMo is, it's National Novel Writing Month. It's been going for about 10, 15 years. It's something where everybody yeah. gets together in November who is brave enough and tries to write a novel during November. Um, so I know there's probably going to be a few people out there looking for extra tips. I've just been roped in to try it for the first time. I uh, tried it once. Yes. Uh, yeah, any I of think these? I wrote... I wrote about 5,000 words a day for the first five days, and then I gave up. <laughs> <laughs> um, I I've think I, I overdid it. <laughs> yeah, 5,000 is pretty, in that's, in that's intense. That's really intense. <laughs> I just need to lie down after the first five days. Five days, that's still 45,000 words. That's a, that's a short novel yeah, or a yeah. long novella. That's pretty good. Um, yeah, so I, um, what made me so just do those, because I want to start getting into some in-depth stuff. Um, I remember, yeah. um, especially when it comes to character introductions, you were saying how you, uh, you were talking about how you want the characters to feel capable for the kids. Um, I remember you were at um, Castamain Library, where I normally work, a couple of years back after How to Be had just come out, and you were giving a workshop for some kids, and you talked about one of the ways that you, were think, you, you think about character when you um, introduce them that has just stuck with me. And I think it was something you stole from Chuck Polinick. Yeah, um, <laughs> I steal a lot of stuff from Chuck. <laughs> He's a really good teacher. <laughs> um, is that something you'd, you'd be able to just very quickly run down? So um, I was, was two probably or three points talking you... about trust and empathy. So um, when you, like if you give your character a skill, um, like Peony and, and Neoma have skills, uh, you, sort of, you sort of give them a little bit of authority and also, um, I, when, once you have that authority, people are more likely to believe what they say and it feels more real. But also what I do is I like to create um, a little bit of failure early on. So um, if you think of how to be, when Peony tries out to be a bee the first time, she fails. And so that's generating empathy. So, I mean, that's the... That's the second chapter where she fails, I think. And so by the second chapter, people are like, oh, peony. Um, and you can see Veronica Roth does this too when she um, opens um, Divergent. <laughs> um, she starts really, really quietly with Tris getting a haircut from her mother. Um, and she's meant to be abnegation but she's just turned 16 she wants to look in the mirror she's not supposed to look in the mirror she's supposed to be like abnegating from all that vanity and stuff and wear gray and all that stuff so she kind of constantly fails at, at abnegation um you've got this beautiful scene and the mother being kind to um to tris 
Um, so that sort of makes you feel a little bit of empathy for her. But then um, she, when she hops on the bus and she's going to Sears Tower and she forgets to give up the seat and you can see that, um, yeah, she's, she's kind of failing constantly at abnegation, but she knows all this stuff about this world that she's t telling us about. And then she sort of reveals that she'll have to choose a faction and you're like, well, it's not going to be abnegation. You don't like, she feels compelled to stay in abnegation. Cause I mean, it's an honorable thing to put, put aside your own well-being for the, the rest of the community. But we're like, you can't stay in abnegation. You're not abnegation. So we kind of like we're feeling for her and we're feeling for these little failures she keeps making and, and we've got that empathy going. Um, even before we get to the whole exciting divergent leap on off trains and do all that sort of stuff was that we trust and trust because she's told us about the world, she knows about the world, but she's also constantly sort of failing and that sort of builds up a little bit of empathy. So, yeah, so trust and empathy and a bit of knowledge right in the opening can get readers to sort of follow your character. Mm, yeah, um, personally, I've just been I've about halfway through Count of Monte Cristo, um, which I've never read before. And he does that again brilliantly, maybe the first three chapters with the main character. And yeah. I just, just hearing you talk about it, then I, I remember being struck by how quickly you were rooting for this main character. He'd been painted in a couple of little brush strokes, but he's um, risen up to be a captain after the captain died and he's like 19 he shows up all, all this skill um he um has all these friends so you you learn that he's knowledgeable he's skillful he's maybe a bit young and maybe a bit naive you see that maybe some some people are already kind of plotting against him and you oh maybe he's a little yeah. bit fallible and then he fails completely at at like getting married getting the the captaincy he was promote promised all of his other stuff you know even staying free and like in three chapters you're in love with this guy because yeah. he's skillful he's brilliant he's a little bit naive and he fails and so and yeah, yeah but yeah but i mean i was great. one I, it was <laughs> I, I i was just in awe. like I, I remember feeling so connected to it i was talking to a, a friend at work about it about how quickly i was in this book it was just brilliant this ancient like look my ancient but really old <laughs> classic and feeling how skillfully he'd done it but you in you just um, yeah. kind of articulating once, it once made you me know. realize, oh, that's how yeah. he did it. Yeah, once you know, you can see it everywhere. Yeah. And you're like, oh, I didn't like <laughs> click onto this before. <laughs> yeah, it's amazing once you start like picking apart stories, but yes, the little okay. techniques, whether, whether the writer knew they were doing them half the time or mm. not, whether they're conscious or not conscious. Yeah, yeah how, well, that's probably leads into another interesting thing. How much of yours is conscious planning and how much is pantsing? How much? Um, I pants a lot because I kind of, um, I kind of believe that my head knows what a story looks like, knows the shape of a story, knows, knows these things. So I write, um, and if I have neglected something, I can go back and adjust that later, but I just sort of write flat out as fast as I can and get where I'm going. Um, and just trust that my brain knows the shape of a story. And um, sometimes you get comments like, I never knew where the story was going next. I'm like, well, maybe it doesn't. Know <laughs> <laughs> Is that a good thing or a bad thing? <laughs> I think Stephen King said that he does, he deliberately, when he's writing suspense, he deliberately doesn't try and figure out what the ending is until he finds out himself through writing it. Because that way, yeah. there's definitely some, there's definitely yeah. a surprise because he was surprised. <laughs> yeah, you, you, you can come up with those surprises if you're mm. not. Like if you plan it all out, it takes the steam out of it sometimes because you're no longer writing to entertain yourself. You're just writing to fill in boxes and that's not much fun. <laughs> um, but writing by the seat of your pants means you will write more words because somewhere you will go wrong and <laughs> yeah. you'll have to backtrack or you'll have to throw away a few scenes that didn't eventuate into anything. And yeah, so there will be... You'll massacre your wordage. <laughs> It'll be all over the place. <laughs> so do you do distinct drafts? Do you just um, start from scratch or do you fix up chapter by chapter or you rewrite over the top of everything you've done? Um, I write, yeah, I write flat out and quite often I will edit a bit as I go and adjust things because when, you, um, when you're writing in worlds that are different, 
you might change something and then you go oh well that means something else so like um it's hot so the sea has risen oh but that means it's hotter so crocodiles can come further south so that means there's crocodiles here so that means you know everybody has to be careful near the waterfront we can't have little kids just roaming around outside the you know the waterfront mm. and people have to be on the sea wall to keep lookout and all that sort of stuff so it, yeah, it's sort of like if you add something, then it sort of uh, expands. So you've got to go back and go, oh, I've got to be careful about crocs here. Or I've got to do this or do that. Yeah. So when you're writing changed worlds, it's kind of layering up the changes because the world is so interconnected that one thing changes everything. So we're hmm. such a small planet. <laughs> <laughs> That's my favorite part about sci-fi is all the, the different ways people try and interconnect all the ideas when they're world building. So, yeah. how, so how much world building do you do pre and how much do you do during the writing then? How much do um, you... I don't do a lot of world building pre-writing. Um, I did a lot of research for the dog runner, of course, once I, um, once I read Dark Emu and I realised I was going to be another white person who ignored thousands of years of grass cultivation. I thought, well, I'm not going to be that. I'll have to go back and incorporate that. Um, so I had to go and do some research on that and research on mushrooms and research on, research on dogs, dog carting and um, dog mushing. And yeah, so I did a lot of research for that book, which I managed to incorporate again in, in the edits. But um, how to be, I thought I knew a lot about bees, but you know, like any subject, uh, the more you learn, the more you understand there is to learn. Um, yeah, so you kind of set off and um, I was trying to be really scientific about how much the sea would rise, but in the end I just went, you know, I'm going to get a bit more fictional with this one and just lift the seas as much as I want and <laughs> then, you know, flood Sydney and do whatever <laughs> Why I not? like. Why not? Yeah. You're the author, you're allowed. Uh, I mean, I, I thought, well, you know, crocs and sharks, if I can get a little bit willful mm. and they can do strange things. And then um, after I wrote this, that shark in um, Tasmania jumped on the boat. And I'm like, yes. I didn't know sharks could do that. I thought I was the only one with a shark that could jump on the boat. You have a couple. You have a shark that jumps on the boat and a crocodile as well. And so. a crocodile. Oh. Yeah, so watch out for those crocodiles. <laughs> um, how much was your, because, um, you know, it's, probably not too big a secret, you know, across the Risen Sea. There's some pirates. How much was your pirate captain influenced by Captain Hook and the crocodile? And <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, I guess if you're going to have a, you're going to have a pirate, you're going <laughs> to and a crocodile, then you're going to have comparisons to Captain Hook. Um, I don't know. I, I, I just wanted to make like some old salty woman who just couldn't be killed, like, you know, just made her... Just amazing, Warren horrible Rose Terminator of a woman. <laughs> yeah, just like she was tough as old nails. And I'm thinking, yeah, it couldn't really be a man then too soft. It's got to be a woman <laughs> yeah. to be that tough. <laughs> so I just made this old pirate hag and um, she was a bit devious as well. <laughs> yeah, a lot devious. Um, <laughs> and so did you do lots of research on sailing or was that something that you would... Um, I have been sailing a little bit. So I have like taken control of a sailing boat occasionally. I'm not very good at it. Um, <laughs> last time, last time I was out on Auckland Harbour in a sailboat, and uh, the skipper went down below to take a phone call because he was meant to be at work, and um, he was pretending oh, no. he was at work while taking a phone call <laughs> on, the, on the yacht. And I was sailing towards um, a ship, and you know, big ships mm. don't give way. No. Little <laughs> ships. The smaller you are, the more you have to give way. And I'm like, okay, I'm going to have to tack. I'm going to have to tack. And I was like, I have to tack. I have to tack. And he was like, shh, shh, shh. <laughs> give me a minute. Give me a minute. And I'm like, no, 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 I have to tack. I have to tack. And then the ship just went. <laughs> the was the noise. Blown. Oh, my God. I was like, and he came running up and he was like. Oh. And then he, you know, he loosens off the ropes and I start to tack because it's kind of. Yeah, if you're a beginner, it's a two-person job to throw the ropes off and, mm. and yeah, swing and the, the ship around and get the boom going. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the boom swinging around is just dangerous and scary. Yeah, yeah. I, I, the first time I went sailing, I actually met a boom and got 
picked up and thrown across the deck and I landed. <laughs> I've got a scar in the center of my back where I landed on a, a stanchion. Ouch. Stabbed that's... myself in the back. Well, the, the person didn't yell tack, so that's mm. not good enough. <laughs> Whereas you were yelling tack really loudly. I need to tack. I need to tack. I need to tack. <laughs> Come do the ropey thing while I do the steering thing. <laughs> the ropey thing. <laughs> You're not really showing off your research skills there, Bran. The ropey thing and the steering thing. <laughs> yeah, as long as you know how it basically works. <laughs> how to watch the woolies is the big one. Watch the woolies. The woolies with little bits of wool on them on the ah, yacht. Yes. Yacht sail. <laughs> The triangle thing. <laughs> the big and, um, Yeah. <laughs> You've got to get the woolies to flap. <laughs> um, so you brought four kids in what um, some people think is a scary subject, but mostly cli-fi stuff that's approaching rapidly, unfortunately, um, in various ways. Um, but you say, um, you, is, do you set a particular tone for yourself you say i'm going to go this scary but no further do you um just say like this is what it's going to be like or what i think it might be like in these particular circumstances and just go with it or do you modify the language or the way the characters react to situations so it's yeah i try not to um i think in the dog runner is probably the scariest because the climate effects are happening and they have to flee the city but the other two everything's already happened and the world is resettled so I think that's means it's not so scary it's not so immediate it's not something that's going to threaten the reader so much but I think the readers are already threatened by mm. <laughs> the news and being hyper aware and the media saturation about climate change so when I was young um we weren't so media saturated, but we we were so upset about um, nuclear, the Cold War and nuclear bomb possibilities. And there was nothing for me to read as a kid what my life might like be like if, say, a bomb went off in Russia or America. What was it going to be like down here? There was nothing for me to read and see. And I was always really worried. And And, you know, you can turn to books to escape, which a lot of people do. Or you can turn to books to try and imagine what a future life might be like. So when I write my books, I'm saying to kids, and like, if that happens, this is what life might be like and this is how we'll survive. And what I try to do is I try to show that even though things are different um, and even though there's a lot of poverty or perceived poverty because, like, money doesn't really exist anymore in Across the Risen Sea, um, and they're actually really rich because they have, you know, they have food and boats and a place to live. Um, so what I'm trying to say is that life might change, but you can still have everything that, you know, you really need to get by. Um, so you can have love and family and friends and dignity and, and purpose and, and hopefully food and accommodation. <laughs> and all the really important things can still be there. So... What I'm trying to say is this is what life might be like. So, yeah, I'm not trying to be didactic or anything and say this is what it will be like. Um, and the stories aren't about climate change. The, the story is about um, the owner rescuing Jag and um, getting out of the city to getting the whole family to safety and um, working on the orchard and not working as a maid in the city. So <laughs> yeah. they, those stories are against a backdrop. So, uh, yeah, so I'm not really dealing with climate change, I don't think, mm. except I'm saying that if life changes and, you know, the world is constantly changing and it has to change or we can't survive if we keep going the way we're going. Um, yeah, if it changes, it's not the end. We can still have everything that we need and we can still be good people and have a lot of mm. fun and live good lives yeah that's hopefully what I hopefully <laughs> that's, what <I'm> <laughs> that's what i really love about your books is um there is this massive disaster and sometimes it's e extremely impactful especially in something like the across the risen sea but even then um versions of society have collapsed people haven't collapsed and families haven't collapsed um 
even in how to be um, society itself hasn't completely col it hasn't collapsed it's kind of folded in a little bit and there's a sense yeah. that maybe it'll grow out again um, and the, the yeah. dog runner in particular has something really dramatic happen really fast but even then there's still a chance of even if not going back to how it was going back to something that's almost as good or even if it's different um, yeah. and even and then on top of that you have those kids who except for possibly in the dog runner don't know any different and they're just being kids and they're hopeful yeah, and loving is, and they're adventurous yeah. and this is they just how life big is. And and yeah. Mobile phones if they've never had them. <laughs> and they're, yeah, and they're just they're just being brave, adventurous kids who have proper human connections with uh, with each other and none of that's gonna go away no matter what happens with climate change. Yeah, which is yeah. a really nice thing for um even slightly terrified adults to see. <laughs> <laughs> um and remember. <laughs> um, yeah. Now, I know it's probably slightly off topic, but I did want to very quickly ask you about In the Dark Spaces because um, this, is a, this is a great book. It's, speaking of scary, this is oh, much scarier. You. Part of the reason why... That is scary. <laughs> this That's is part of the reason why name. it's called Kelly Black is so that the kids yeah. who are reading Bren McDibble books don't accidentally pick up the Kelly Black book. Yeah, don't get <laughs> That one's for high school, not for yeah. primary school. But... Um, if we, since we were talking about world building and approaches to world building earlier, I would just want to talk to you about the the bird aliens in this. They have a very complex society, and again, it comes into environmental things as well. But um, I I can't believe that you didn't do some planning for how their society works. You just pants this and then worked it out as I you were going. I pants this, but it, it's <laughs> something ridiculous, like 65,000 words long. I pants <laughs> it by writing about 200,000 words. Um, <laughs> um, and yeah, 65,000 words made it through. <laughs> so I actually wrote the story, I would say about five times, um, just keeping bits of it and chucking the rest and starting again and starting again and starting again. That was, yeah, before I sent it off to um, Hardy Grant Egmont uh, and it, it won the Ampersand Prize for her first novel. So, and then it got cut more. <laughs> like, As editors tend to do. At that stage, it was still almost 90,000 words and then it had to come back to 65. Ouch. Yeah, so, yeah, and bits got thrown out and bits got added and... Yeah, it's yeah the um, the world again developed as I went. I wanted to show the working poor, and um, and a girl caught up in the working poor um, and not being part of community. She's just been isolated, and that sort of I wanted to her to have sort of first contact and being not part of the human world she would be more readily available to learn about the alien world and then be the go-between be the translator between them so um setting her up on a, a freighter a deep space freighter um the magic happened once i started using centripetal force to provide the gravity and then when you know when you spin spin something and the outer edge of whatever you're spinning has you can make that have earth gravity but the inner flaws like you'll walk around with your feet pointing out because you're you're spinning um the inner flaws have less gravity and so then i had all the rich people living in full gravity then i had the poor people living in the the, the workers all living on the inner gravity and right at the center where there is no gravity of course that's the perfect place for ships to come and go and land um but then the people on the lesser gravity had less muscle, less muscle tone, so they could never leave the ship. Whenever they went to a planet that had decent gravity, they would be too exhausted. Their muscles would be too wasted to actually do anything. So then, then they were trapped on these freighters where they were only paid just enough to keep living. Um, and then they could never leave. They couldn't leave because they could never raise the funds to live anywhere else, but also because they were physically weakened. So I thought, oh, so, you know, this is just the perfect allegory for the working poor. They earn just enough to keep working and never enough to change their lives. So I was pretty happy when that sort of, those layers started playing out. I was really excited. Um, 
Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then when I, um, when I developed the aliens, I wanted to contrast. And so I wanted them to be about society and not about money and not about um, inequality, about everybody being eligible to live decent lives. Um, so I made that more like a beehive where everybody works for the good of the hive and everybody works for the good of the community and you earn status by working harder and you don't earn status by hoarding money or, or whatever else and there was no currency and everybody was fed and everybody was looked after. So I sort of made that more like, yeah, a beehive and I actually called it a hive. So, yeah. <laughs> Uh, but then you even had some of the complexities of the language that then fed into all of that, and it was all really interesting. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. I, but yeah, I suppose developing the language. <laughs> it, it, it all just gets layered up and layered up and layered up like an oil painting that you go over ten times. <laughs> and you just yeah these little ideas come to you as you're writing, and you're like, oh, that's so good. I've got to go back and put that. All <laughs> Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm more impressed that, that you're basically making all, that up all on the fly and then just fixing it as you went rather than sitting there and planning all of that because it did seem very intricately built together. So. It was, <laughs> but it was just experience <laughs> from writing it five times <laughs> and then editing it for over a year, <laughs> over a year with Hart, Hardy Guy and Egmont. We really did that one. Um, so, but do you think you'll write some climate fiction at the Cali Black level or? Um, I, I may do. It's, um, yeah, it's hard at the moment. Um, the news on the street is that young adults want softer stories and more gentle stories and not, not scary stories. So, but I may write something with a kind of a climate change background similar to, to these ones. So set against it, not, not dealing with it, not, um, in the throes of it, but after it's resettled. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I'm playing around with a, a few stories at the moment for YA, but I, um, my writing style's a little bit aggressive, I think, for the current market. <laughs> 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 but I'm going to come up with something soft, <laughs> soft. The whole first chapter in this is so soft. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, oh, the first chap yeah, the first chapter in the dark space is it's gorgeous the, the <laughs> love between the little family that you're talking about is really really yeah. nice even though yeah. it's in awful circumstances and then the blood and then starts it, <laughs> and it all goes to hell. like i've lured you in <laughs> <laughs> there's something to say about writing against the market as well so that you stand out a bit and you've already run the RLs, haven't you haven't you yeah. earned yourself a little bit of leeway to i've got um two Aurealis now i've got um, uh, for the dog runner ah uh, yes Awesome. Yeah. So you cool. would think I had, but yeah, you would think you you have a bit of sci-fi clout to say. No, I need to write some blood in my sci-fi. <laughs> it, it is it is a difficult market, the YA. Yeah, mm. I find there's there's a lot of demands um, that have to be met for young adult readers. Yeah, and the um, the wants of the editors change quite fast too, as the as the tastes of or at least the fashions change. It's sometimes hard to keep yeah. up with. Yeah. Um, yeah, and the, the quiet stories are having a go at the moment. <laughs> quiet, quiet, calm stories, which is good to yes, see. People need, people need it all. People need variety. <laughs> but, you know, I mm. think the kids are going to start questioning the future is still out there. <laughs> as, well as, the, as well as the escapism, there's also the survivalisms. Yeah. Yes. Um, the, I mean, even the fantasy is quite bloody at the moment for YA. It's quite a bit of yeah. quite a few assassins and thieves and dark tales going on in, in YA fantasy. Yeah, so why can't YA Look, sci fi be I, bloody? <laughs> you can do anything since Suzanne Collins put kids in an arena and made them kill each other. <laughs> yes. oh Honestly. My. The, well, the first At least I had a war. <laughs> <laughs> There's only been two, two YA novels that have completely traumatized me i mean even patrick ness's um the knife of never letting go which is yeah. often quite dark and nasty was probably just under where, where it was traumatizing me i was not expecting the blood in susan collins and the, the viciousness and there was one by it's an irish the, writer called premise. peter oh. o'guillen i cannot yeah. remember the, the title of it but the premise was basically a, a, a giant spaceship where 
almost everything on it was sentient, which meant everybody was eating everybody else. Oh and that no. was a YA novel, and it was brutal and awful, And because they were basically different tribes with different levels of intelligence and different cultures, all just killing and eating each other. And that was a YA... Gr uh, yeah, that one was shocking to me too. Oh. <laughs> so, <laughs> if you, so, you know, you're not going to mass um, genocide and cannibalism. You haven't gone too far yet then, Brent. <laughs> <laughs> I, think that, I think the issue also is that my style is a bit more raw and in your face than Suzanne Collins is. So um, she steps back a little bit. She doesn't. <laughs> do the blood and the gore, but um, I'm kind of like yeah, yeah, there is a bit of gore. Death is ugly. <laughs> death is ugly. It's going to be ugly. Which is not a bad thing. I mean, th I think you need. It's not bad to be honest about these things, or at least your yeah, kind of. Yeah, well, it's war. Yeah. I'm not going to glorify. Well, I made a little war between the humans and the aliens, and I'm not going to glorify what that might look like. It's, it's going to be really traumatizing and horrible for anybody involved. So, and because I'm, I go deep within the point of view also my mm. character has to has to like be emotionally broken when she sees things that are really horrible and of course she would be she's grown up on a spaceship you know yeah. in a little stowaway. she hasn't but seen anything other like people that. doing third person they sort of have that little level of a detachment which makes it less impactful on the reader i think so which is you know if you're dealing with death and mayhem that's probably <laughs> I can't do that though. No. <laughs> I'm always going to be deep and I'm That's always going to be raw and ugly. <laughs> it's part of the fun is getting in there and finding out how much you can torture the character. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I pretty much break them. Um, um, well, yeah. If she didn't have Gub to come back to, she would have like, she would have just laid down and died because mm. it was just all too much for her. Oh, little Gub. He's so cute. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so, so would, again, was that a deliberate inclusion, having having someone so... Yeah. Just, <laughs> to, just to, it was to contrast just, the darkness. Yeah, we needed little Gub. We needed the, the will to go on. We needed <laughs> yeah. the softness and we needed her just to hang on to something. Like to keep doing all the things that she was asked to do by the aliens and the humans, mm. to keep doing that without the payoff of helping her family that was kind of a bit selfish so like i'm just doing it to stay alive like yeah there yeah. Gets, comes a point where that doesn't wash anymore <laughs> if you're doing it to look after your little um cousin yeah there's a point where even a teenager would give up after some of the stuff they went yeah, through like, yes. nah, just shoot me <laughs> yeah. i'm not doing it <laughs> um so you were saying you're a pantser um or at least mostly a pantser and you kind of do a lot of yeah. it instinctually do you have like guiding principles as far as story structure and things go do you look at like monomyth or three-act structure or five-act structure or any of that sort of stuff or do you just write until the story feels the right shape yeah look i'm i'm just prepared to um i'm prepared to go off in a direction and have a go knowing that it i'm not going to keep it i'm not precious at all um I know that I will c can come back. I, th I think I think about a three-act structure as I set off. Um, I think it's all in my head and I know it and it, it, I'm going to get somewhere and I'm going to get to the, you know, the climax and the, 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 the follow-through afterwards and all that sort of stuff. But um, I write with the expectation that what I'm writing might be useless and I'll have to backtrack. And I, I use Scrivener, which... Um, stores things scene by scene by scene so I can always just take scenes out and put them away and put in new scenes and go in a different direction so trial and error and I expect to write far more than I'll need um, the act of writing is like the act of telling myself the story and it's fun and entertaining <laughs> and it, yeah I like to do that so <laughs> Yeah, you know, I think Terry, Terry Pratchett said that the first draft is just you telling yourself the story and then the work yeah. starts. Yeah. 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 <laughs> um, I, yeah. Do, I have a question from the chat. Um, oh. So when you're pantsing, do you start off with an idea of your intended theme or you discover the theme itself as you're going? Is there um, I, I want to write what I'm interested in. So if I'm interested, I'm interested obviously in climate fiction. I'm interested in the future. I'm interested in um, science fiction. So I will tend to start off 
um, just with a situation um, and a character. And as I'm going, the themes will sort of become, they'll emerge and then I will take them on um, sort of more seriously and make sure they work. So, yeah, they, I don't, yeah, I don't really come out with a theme. Um, you could argue that they're all the same theme. They're about family and love and <laughs> <laughs> being, um, being respected and um, finding a place in the world. So you could argue that maybe that's the theme of all of them. Hmm. <laughs> Maybe I only write one theme in many different ways. <laughs> you wouldn't be the first author to do that quite successfully. So. <laughs> no, but yes, it's very much a big thing in all of them. Even the Kelly Black is is enduring and yeah. fighting for, for the cause of family. Um, and yes, yeah. yeah. <laughs> place in the world because she's not she's not part of the human world or the alien world. She's kind of mm. trying to find where she fits. Yes, um, which isn't necessarily true. So maybe that's not true of all your characters because I think um, Neoma definitely knows where she fits. Yeah, <laughs> Peony. Peony, yes, Peony knows where she fits even if she's dragged out of it. And Neoma, yeah. Neoma knows where she fits. That's wherever she's going. <laughs> and, and Ella's the youngest child in the family. <laughs> she, knows, she knows she's always going to be part of that family. And yeah, strong parents strong brother but yeah she has, to, <laughs> she has to be strong too um yes actually um you know, i think about the different themes and the different and the darkness and all that sort of stuff it does seem that you seem to win the, the darker you go the more awards you get because <laughs> 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 you um as we were talking about before the stream you've been nominated for the carnegie um as well and yeah yeah for the dog, for the dog runner. runner i got nominated in england for the carnegie Carnegie. Which is an amazing achievement. Mm. Uh, for anybody not knowing who doesn't know, Carnegie, one of the biggest young adult, uh, young adult children's author, children's writers prizes in the world. Um, that's not easy to even get nominated, let alone win. Um, so that's, yeah. that's just amazing being nominated. Um, I've got yes, to write better and then I'll win. <laughs> but yeah, that's, that's all you have to do because it's so easy. <laughs> <laughs> that's all. That's, right a, better. that's a massive competition. That's a, that's, you know. The it's huge. Yeah, the, yeah. Fo the 40, be 40 best books judged by a small, well, by yeah. judged by a few groups. They have, and two, it's different they have tastes. two categories mm. um, the Greenaway Medal, which is the illustration, and then the writing, and the Carnegie. Mm. And about 40 books each. Mm. Um, so, yeah, it's always going to rely on who's voting and what the tastes are or the time are. And so, yeah, just getting to that stage is, is nuts, being recognized yeah. at, that, at that level. Um, yeah, that was pretty special. Now, uh, what do, that's what I'm going to ask you. Um, how much do you read about? Do you read high fi Do you read lots of JF? Do you read? Yeah, I read. Um, I read a lot of junior fiction. I read a lot of YA. Um, I prefer to read those over adult stories, but I also read a lot of adult science fiction as well. Um, I kind of. You know, I read, I read to feed, basically. So I'm always looking for fun language, fun use of um, point of view. And um, basically, you've got to read in the, in the tropes you want to write in. So I've read a lot of climate fiction, a lot of science fiction. Um, because you've got to know when something's being done to death or where something has, you know, failings or, or what the tropes are. Um, you can't reinvent the wheel and you can't. <laughs> There's no point. No one wants the wheel. <laughs> it's already there. Um, yeah, there's no point writing like Veronica Roth or writing like um, Suzanne Collins because Veronica Roth and Suzanne Collins are still writing. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> and publishers didn't just go get their book. <laughs> so I've always been about um, what can I do that's different? Um, what's my point of difference? What's my strength? Uh, what can I learn to make it, it work better? Um, how can I connect with the reader more? Uh, yeah, um, I went to the, the local primary school the other day and I met a teacher and his, his first words were, the problem with your books, oh. Oh, here we go, 
He's like, and he said it three times because he was looking for the next part of the sentence and he didn't want to offend me. But, you know, he said three times, the problem with your books, oh. the problem with your books, the problem. And then he said it, they're too real. That's a and problem? He says, you know, he says, this isn't a problem. This is fantastic for readers who don't have anxiety. <laughs> I think, I've got a couple of kids with anxiety and I don't know if they can handle your books. And I'm like, oh, but I feel like they're hopeful about the future ultimately. <laughs> yeah, I, mean, I, I reckon your books are exactly for those kids. Yeah, like you can go there in a safe space. Mm. <laughs> In a future that may not happen and probably won't happen this bad. I mean, in uh, the dog runner, I killed off all the grass. There's no fungus that can take out every every family of grass. And across the reason say I rose the sea a lot, a lot more <laughs> possibly than there is water on the planet. So, yeah, I'm, I'm kind of just going places that may not actually happen and, and trying to show kids surviving and thriving. Yeah, even if it is even further than what we think it might go, it's still <laughs> possible to survive. Yeah. 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 Well, it is fiction. I'm not writing a textbook here on yeah. the oh, grass fungus. <laughs> the yeah, you world. Got, you got to have fun. It's much more fun to have a have all the grass die because it's just more cinematic. <laughs> yeah, because you don't know how much grass you eat, and then you think of corn, and you think of sugar, and you think of wheat and dairy and meat, and it's mm -hmm. all grass fed, and you're like, oh. Actually, I'm pretty much, you know, I think as I said it, that her dad said, we, you know, you're just like a cow. <laughs> <laughs> and then she said something about eggs in one basket and eggs and baskets are made from grass. <laughs> mm. <laughs> so, yeah, so that was, that was interesting. I thought, yep, I'm going to take them all. So there is no grass-based food anywhere, which still leaves fruit and vegetables, unlike mm. how to be where I just took fruit and vegetables. Death, um, you know, potatoes, tubers, yams. Yeah. <laughs> Plant a few Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yep. Um, oh my goodness, I've gone click on my next mm. question. Sorry. Um, yes. Yeah, so, oh yeah. No, that's the thing. I you went across a completely different subject. So yeah, um, on your point about making sure you knew what's in the space. I mean, as I say, I was reading of Monte Cristo recently and I was trying to think what will I do for the NaNoWriMo I've been um, <laughs> dumped yeah. into and I'm thinking as I'm reading I'm thinking gee this would be a great um, retelling like if you do a sci-fi Count of Monte Cristo oh, hang on no Alfred Bester did that it's called The Star's My Destination and it's already a classic so don't do that because that would be a waste of time <laughs> so you do need to know what's in the space before you start you writing do. things you do need to, like, <laughs> I had to read um, there's a 1940s book about the death of all grass and i read that it's for adults and it, it is awful oh. um oh yay that means you can write a book <laughs> oh, i wanted to write one for children but <laughs> i read that and it was just awful and I, I was it was set in that time um oh like the women folk were getting hysterical and all that sort of stuff and i wanted the women folk to just like kill all the men and go off without them but they never did, so that was a bit sad <laughs> for me. <laughs> but yeah, it was just set in a time where the, the rich people felt like they were obligated to, you know, take control and and have everything. And, and mm. then when they came up against ruffians, <laughs> I'm like, oh, what is this? Please stop. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so it was. It ended really sadly, and it it was sad all the way through, and it ended sadly, and it was elitist and sexist. Mm. And I got to the end, and I was like, oh, <laughs> <laughs> this is a horrible book. But I did learn about the death of grass. I and did you, learn what was out there. <laughs> did you steal any ideas, like about how people would react to different things, or um, did you get anything no. good from it? No, they um they were trying. Well, they were trying to get up country to a, a a family farm, which is what I did too. But their family farm was in a big valley surrounded by rocks, <coughs> with just one entry. So I thought they'd all be safe there. And the brother was a potato farmer, so this was all very convenient. <laughs> um, yeah, but when they got there, the brother had didn't know they were coming because there were no communications networks. And, 
oh, is this a spoiler? I'll save you from reading it. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but when he got there, the brother had already got in help to keep other people out. So he already had like 25 people there and they didn't want his family to come. So there was this massive blue and uh, he accidentally killed his own brother. That definitely doesn't happen in the dog runner. So that's good. Doesn't. I think it was a horrible book. Don't read it. It saved you countless Thank hours you. of being disappointed. <laughs> um, yeah, it's a bit weird to go back to old sci fi sometimes. Oh, I some know. The, I know. Even some, some of the good stuff is weirdly sexist and. <laughs> You kind of have to read around it and hope and give it the and, best and then, interpretation you can. When you when you have an Aurealis winning book like um, In the Dark Spaces, people people who are who are sci-fi readers come and read it, and then you get weird critiques like she's no Arthur C. Clarke, and I'm like, good. No, <laughs> I didn't want to be Arthur no. C. Clarke. He already exists. He's doing something different. <laughs> Yes, he does write some brilliant ideas and has written some brilliant books, but yeah. you know, yes, no, some of his stuff is very old-fashioned now, and, he, and you and don't want to do that anymore. I went to live in Sri Lanka and drove hovercrafts around. Or something <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> he didn't. He did semi-invent the space elevator, so good on him for that. <laughs> Geostationary <laughs> orbits, which is kind of cool. But good on. Him. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, you can't. Yeah, I just because it was a pandemic and I was a big fan of Frankenstein, I went back and reread Mary. Wollstonecraft Shelley's um, The Last Man about the pandemic that kills everybody in the world. And it was awful. Oh, <laughs> um, yeah. It was barely they didn't sci-fi. Have back in the old days no, I bet I mean it was lots of people swanning around being very aristocratic. Um, and so because of course everybody yeah. all, everybody who was dying off was going to be looking looking to the aristocrats to save them and the aristocrats would of course nobly do so. And <laughs> you know, in oh, the, right. in, as they're all being killed off by this pandemic in the two thousands, they're riding horses and carriages around and in air and they're in um, healing powered airships and it's amazing <laughs> and oh, awful really and <laughs> <laughs> but e yeah even then there was barely any science and the plague didn't even kill many people until near the very end it was a very strange book so <laughs> yeah i learned not what not to do <laughs> a lot from that one <laughs> do you have any classics that you do um go back to though you want classics it's people who inspire um, you to write sci-fi because it's definitely come uh, you've got a lot from it for somewhere i really like um there's a, a ya that's not a ya so it would be a new adult i think possibly um snow crash by neil, neil stevenson. stevenson yeah his first book and possibly the only one where he was ever told to write shorter <laughs> yeah, um, <laughs> He did go a bit, he, he, well, I shouldn't, he did go, he's still it's, going a little long in some tight. stuff. It's tightly <laughs> written. It's beautiful. Um, it, that was, that was, an, that's an amazing book. Um, and also I really love, oh, this is probably a classic, um, Roadside Picnic, which is a Russian book. Um, aliens land and they just take over a zone, ignore the humans, like the humans just like ants at a roadside picnic. Um, and then they leave again, and but they've left all this waste material, and then um, people go into the zones to retrieve it and try and sell it. But there's all these strange things in the in the zone wow. where the aliens have landed and left, and there's like moving mists that'll burn your skin off and all sorts of stuff. So then the governments try to keep people out, and this um, character who does nothing but drink vodka. <laughs> called he's Red Russian. Schubert, he goes in, he's, he sneaks in past the authorities and he goes to retrieve tech from the zones and stuff. And he's got a little daughter and she's being born just covered in hair um, and he loves her and, she, and she's called Monkey. And it's, it's not that it's particularly fantastically written because some of it is told um, in third person from a reporter, which gets a bit annoying, but and it kind of flips the point of view a few times. But it, just the ideas in that is really, really wonderful. I love the ideas. That, that's an amazing premise. The hard, hard Russian character, <laughs> hardcore character. I like, oh, I like those hardcore Russians. And what about modern stuff? What are you reading that you like that's modern? Um, what do I like that's modern? God, it's uh, hard to say. Have you read much of the Expanse stuff or no. watched the TV show? Because um, just you talking about the low gravity stuff reminded me there's a whole um, 
culture and almost nation mm. called the Belters in that, which is all people who live on the asteroid belts who have exactly the same oh. problem of having no muscle mass so they can't go into gravity wells and things. Did and someone work do that before me? <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't think it's the worst idea. Uh, it's definitely an idea that's out in the space because it's what could happen and what would happen. It's, it's what a, could it's happen. Yeah. yeah. Um, I can't think. I read a lot of YA science fiction, so I was sort of in my element with the old Hunger Games and Divergent and all them. Um, what have I been reading? I've been reading some James Bradley, which is a bit scary because <laughs> it's all climate, climate fiction. Climate yeah. Stuff. We're saying. Like, oh. mm. um, he's a little bit more honest than me. <laughs> climate fiction. Um, That's Cat young... Sparks is Desert YA one. As well, a future desert. Uh, yeah. Cool. Okay. Uh, well, we're probably about wrapped up then. That, went, oh. that flew by. <laughs> did fly by. Uh, yeah, so I just wanted to stop us before we hit exactly on eight because otherwise I don't get to say goodbye and thank you and all that kind of great stuff. <laughs> um, but yes, I do want to thank you very much for tuning in. In the middle of a what was probably going to be an, a productive afternoon from WA, trying to figure out daylight savings time and different time zones <laughs> and all sorts of weird things. Um, you uh, mentioned we have so many time zones when daylight savings <laughs> is on. Our like, country is too big. Queensland is behind um, South Australia. Yeah. <laughs> How does that happen? <laughs> I can't do it. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we do need to just break off into a few different countries. Forget yeah. this federation thing. Oh, well, <laughs> WA is broken. It's been broken since March. It's, it's not communicating with the rest of the country. <laughs> you guys well. are like three seconds away from just breaking off and declaring independence at the moment. We've got a third of Australia and we're going to run. <laughs> <laughs> That's all good until climate change does hit and nobody wants coal and, and iron anymore. <laughs> No one wants iron ore anymore. We'll be stuffed. Oh, one thing I did want to ask you, um, like nice serious question. You're talking about climate and all that sort of stuff. What are your feelings like real world? What are you? Are you hopeful? Are you scared? I think, I think there's a when you when you talk to kids, you know they're they're all ready to drive Teslas. They're all ready to embrace the electrical age and leave behind the coal and the fossil fuels and everything. They're ready. They don't know. They don't know why we're not moving. Mm. Um, and then you have see people um, like, of course, Greta and all her country worldwide cohorts and um, David Attenborough, who is now coming out and saying, okay, agriculture has to change. We have to give back um, more of the natural world or we won't live. Um, so regeneration of the natural world to calm the atmosphere. So I think we're in for a long haul. We're in for a lot of wild storms and wild weather and disaster after disaster after disaster but i think ultimately we will claw it all back um we will turn more land back to the natural world we will learn how to feed ourselves more on plant-based diet like um attenborough suggests and we will get there i think yeah i'm in the middle of trying to plan um a whole series of different events for um, a climate wise program we're trying to do over summer, including some young people um, doing their own panel about what's coming up. And uh, that includes some people from Castlemaine, where my library is based, who started up the climate um, strike movement in Australia, um, oh, and okay. some people in um, youth government who are also really passionate about it. So it's, I think there are lots of people who are coming up who are very organized, very passionate, and they know what they want, where they they see where we need to go and they're, wi they're willing to put the hard yeah. work in. So even there's if we a, haven't done it right There's a lot of information them. out there. There's a lot of ideas out there and young people with their media saturation, even though they get anxiety from it, they are very good at looking it up and learning. Um, yeah, yeah that, that there's a lot less slacktivism. There's a lot, a lot less, uh, let's just make some Facebook posts or sign some petitions. Yeah. There's a lot more what can we actually do, what, can we strike, and once we've, stri once we've done striking, what else can we do, who can we talk to, what can we make happen, yeah. which is... Well, the, the internet has just devolved into this um, factless void of shouting. <laughs> so young people can see that, they're not stupid, mm. they can see that they're not going to get anywhere adding to that noise, um, they have to physically do something, um, yeah. 
Yes, Good. <laughs> post, post factual world, isn't it? Yes. Post post truth world, they mm. call it. Well, yes. Well, the truth and the science and stuff is still out there. You just need to it's know how to trust there. it and who to trust, rather than. You can't just believe what you want to yeah. believe. Yes. Don't believe the media outlets that just happen to be owned by people I who choose to get money from telling you things. Wrong. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You can't choose facts. It doesn't work that you way. Can't choose facts. <laughs> Happen, whether It'd be you like it so or much not. easier if we could. Yeah. Um, but yes, anyway, um, thank you very much, Bryn, because I think we are actually out of time now. Thank you, everybody who's watching. Um, thank you for having me. Yes, that was brilliant. And if you are still watching, if you haven't read these books, read them. They're great. The writing is great. The plotting is great. The characters are so <laughs> good. And you know the themes, it's just great. There's a reason why they have a million awards. But so thank you very much for watching, and thank you again, Bryn. Thank you, Stuart. Thanks. Bye-bye, everybody.